Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We're giving you a forewarning of something important tonight, a possible impending crisis in the NHS. Winter is coming, and that is the busy season. But strange things have been happening to climate in the NHS. There appears to have been no summer, no quiet season. It's operating at full pelt through the year, so we're heading into winter without any slack. And that could be catastrophic for waiting times over the next few months. Now, you'll see what I'm talking about in this film, made by Nick Blakemore, documenting a slice of life at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham over a four-day period. Before you watch, remember that while the NHS is a caring human service, it can also be seen as a production line. There is a flow of people in and out of treatment, and the two have to match. If the back end is clogged up, the effects ripple back through the system. <laughs> Edie Sister, can I help? My name's Eve Gillespie. I'm one of the senior sisters in the A&E department at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Lovely, thank you. So you've still got two empty at the moment. Lovely. Yeah. As soon as we get some space out here, we'll think about shopping people around, OK? The way that things have become in A&E over the last two years, you know, it, it, we're at breaking point. It, it can't carry on. The queues on the corridor and the, the situation that the patients are in and the department's in, it. It's unsafe. Well, I slipped down the stairs and I think I broke my foot. I'm in a lot of pain. Very bad. So you just don't expect to see so many people and, you know, people not having beds, not being seen to by doctors. It just feels like we're in a third world country, to be honest with you. We're probably seeing about 100 patients more per day than we were a year ago. Two or three patients used to be stressful, but over the last couple of years, this is just an average day that we would have this many patients on, on the corridor at one time. And we're not even in winter yet. No, no, sorry, excuse me. We're going into the emergency department to see a gentleman who's already been in the emergency department for over eight hours. So where are we going? Going to recess. He needs to be in a bed on our medical admissions unit. We haven't been able to find that space for him. I think the delay we've got is because we're waiting for a side room. Yeah, OK. So, is he going to be stable enough to go into a side room? Probably is, actually, isn't it? If yeah, we can get his blood pressure up a bit. a little bit more fluid. I don't know what The NHS is breaking at the seams. The amount of people who need the services that we can offer is growing, and we just do not have the resource to deal with them. Although he's not for um, full resuscitation, actually, I would expect him to recover from this episode, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, okay. brilliant. Well, that's Thank okay. you, Adam. For the reason we have people queuing around the corners in the emergency department is because the whole system is stuck. We're congested. There's nowhere for anybody to go. If I can't discharge people from the back end of the hospital, so people needing the long-term care because of lack of community services, that means there's no beds coming up on the acute wards, which means there's no beds coming up on the medical admissions unit, and that's why people are stuck in A&E cubicles or even on the corridor in the emergency department. Right then, Bernard, how are you feeling? Fully brought me knackered all the time. Can't use energy up. Doing anything else, we've used it up trying to breathe. Mm. I've been a pain in the arse on the ward because I know I have, because I'm blocking a sick person's bed up and I know that I can't do anything else for me. And you've been in hospital for it's about five yeah. weeks this time, isn't it? Yeah. And because of you getting so breathless, that's why we're looking for you to move into 24 hour care. Isn't that's it, right, too? yeah. But where? But I must have had four people come to talk to me, been rejected by all of them because of this. Mm. Because care arms don't normally have built-in oxygen. Bernard's told us that four different places have turned him down so far. And when I asked him how that made him feel, he pointed out that nobody actually gives him the direct message. 
the staff come and assess him and then they never actually say to his face, we don't want you. I ain't bothered snuffing it tomorrow. I wouldn't do anything to help it. I don't want revolving again. I don't want to keep coming backwards. I don't want to live whatever the rest of my life is like this. I'm going to go and leave you, all right? Yeah. Do you want me to get on to bring you a... Is that still hot? Yeah, it that's is still all hot. Right. Can we start moving some people down into rooms for me? The one at the front into two, one behind into three, and then we'll go... Yeah. This chappy into two for me, and then the lady behind into three. I got cancer. Right. <laughs> and what happened today? Pardon? What happened today? Well, I've been very weak. <laughs> and so I had to get in touch with my relatives, yeah. and got in touch with the doctors, yeah. and here I am. I phone up every morning because we, li we live a bit of a way from Frank. And over the past few days, he's becoming become uh, progressively weaker. How do you feel about having to wait in the corner? Well, it's a sign of our times, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're under so much pressure now, with various things. So, uh, it's what you expect, really. Ten years ago, I never once nursed a patient in the corridor, never once had to shuffle people around and explain why we were sitting them out into the waiting room. It was easily managed within the department over the years. I mean, especially the last two years. The renal colic man can go into six. It's, it's just dreadful. It's, there's just no space for people. I mean, walk around yeah. and see if there's anyone that can move out of cubicles so we can offload the new ones on. Yes. So, I asked you to come here so we can complete an assessment on your mother who is Vera Yates, yeah? Date of birth, the 30th of the 8th, 1924. She's got advanced vascular dementia. I won't be recommending continuing healthcare at this moment in time. Where does this leave mum as far as her care? It just means now that her care will not be funded by health. So she will receive £155 and five pence per week from the NHS right. towards her care in a nursing home. I have 30 beds on this ward. Back in January, I had three or four patients possibly who'd been on here for a few weeks. Most people are on here for two or three weeks at the most. Now, I have at least 10 patients who are out on the social services computer system waiting for a long-term placement. I'm getting people with more challenging behavioural problems on the ward. They're the people who find it hard to find a care home that can meet their needs. Have you had a cup of tea this afternoon, Mum? You think so? The overall process of moving from where we are now to where Mum needs to be during the next few weeks is just the, the concern that we have at the moment. My background is sort of where, it, it, when you start the process off, you, at the beginning you, 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 you create a deadline, don't you? Uh, I don't know whether that's there and I'm just concerned that this thing will drag on. QB alert phone. I tore my desk. Hello, I'm ringing from uh, yep. Amy. We're getting a code read through. Um, so if we could have a massive Pelvic transfusion protocol um, pack, please. Yeah. And TXO. I will ring when we've got details. At, at 15 minutes number, okay? by land, yeah. It's a, it's a th okay. I'll call you back as soon as I've got a hospital number and trauma name. It's a, it's a 30 year old male. Yeah, we've got two staff. Yep. We've got no ITU beds for the code red. Okay. Which I'm addressing at the moment because I'm going to have to pull someone out of ITU into the beds that Dibdi have given me. Yep. Um, to see the NHS as it is now, um, I don't see it getting any better. Because I've got another empty one. Uh, I don't know what the answer is to it. Okay. So we're just yeah. checking next door. But in my eyes, it's just gonna, it's just gonna get worse. Um, so he 
has had agonal breathing and um, they're worried cardiovascularly um, so agonal breathing uh, was agitated it was a push bike Hello, I'm ready for an we've got a code red trauma call through for in about 15 minutes it's a 30 year old male who's parasitic i feel for the patients how long have we got 15 minutes I feel for the new nurses coming through that are going to have to to work in in an emergency department like this and to never have known it how it was. You know, it's it's a shame. It just seems to be acceptable to to treat people on the corridor, and you know, it's it's not dignified, really, is it? It's it's not the way we want to treat our patients, but. We don't have a choice. It's not secured to the school. Heroic efforts to cope at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. So that's how it feels at one very large hospital. We'll talk to the chief executive there shortly. But I'm with our policy editor, Chris Cook, so we can get more on the national picture and give us the sort of wider sense of what's going on in emergency services around well, the country. The key thing to know is that Birmingham is absolutely not alone. There is a structural problem with A&E at the moment. Now remember, what we look for in A&Es is that 95% of their patients should be dealt with within four hours of their turning up. So we've got a graph here to show you how things used to be. This is the 95% line. This is where they're supposed to be. This is for 2011-12. And on the left-hand side of the, the, the graph, this is summer 2011. This is the winter where you can see there's a dip in performance and the far end is yeah, the but they're, spring they're and summer. Mostly in, they're mostly at about 95% there. Exactly. There's a little okay. wobble in the winter, but that's, that's it. Right. So we draw on the year after that. So we go for 2012-13. You can see there's a much bigger wobble in the winter. It takes longer to get back to the line. But, you know, we're still up there. We're still in the, in the, in the game for 95%. It's worth drawing in now the line for 2015-16, which is a very different year. First of all, it starts off a bit lower it dives really deeply and it doesn't really recover. We lose a sort of chunk of performance this year, which we've never got back. In fact, if we draw in the line for last year, what you can see is that the service started low, well off that 95% line. It dived really low. It's pulled it back, but we're still going into this winter a very long way from where we are supposed to be. Right. Now, that's a &E. Obviously, hospitals do a lot more than a &E. What's the importance of the accident and emergency? Well, I mean, apart from their intrinsic importance right. as health providers, what you saw in the film was really quite good examples of how they're interconnected to everything else. You can't run a good A&E without good social care, without other good hospitals, without effective GPs. So the measure of the A&E is quite helpful as, if you like, a, it's a canary in the coal mine. It helps us see the bigger picture, the bigger health, the health of the health system itself. OK, Chris, thank you. Now, well, back in February, we showed you a film about how they were coping at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, like we did tonight. And we spoke to Dame Julie Moore, the woman in charge there. She was candid about the problems, but that was the end of the winter. So we have her back now to see how the management is coping with the pressure uh, we saw in the film. Very good evening to you. What is your best case for this winter? I think the film has really said it all, that A&E is just a part of an overall process. I am slightly more optimistic this winter because what we've done, and this is a relatively new building, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, is over the summer, starting at the end of last winter, we've been stripping out all non-clinical accommodation around the A&E department, which is due to open next week, the week after, to create additional capacity. But the walls are not elastic. We've got very little else we can do with that. So changing rooms, locker rooms, offices have all gone and due to open and start You've turned those into more wards basically? Uh, into more beds and more assessment areas and they will open up um, next week. Okay. So that, that's one issue. The second issue though is staffing because even if we could open up lots and lots more capacity A&E, ED is not proving to be a popular um, profession for people anymore because of the pressures we've right. just seen. So I worry about how we're going to staff those for the future. Well, you, you, OK, so it doesn't have to be bad this winter, but what is the worst case? Because we've heard kind of worries about flu coming in from Australia, all these kinds of things. What is it that you might lose sleep over? Well, it came out in the film that one of the things that's really changed over the past couple of years is patients who are delayed in hospital who no longer need acute medical care, but 
can't get out into the social care system or into other NHS provision. Both of those are causing delayed transfers for those patients. And we've seen that go from an average of about 20 patients three, four years ago to now in excess of 71. And um, Last year we lost 25,000 bed days for patients who don't need to be there. Now, I'm a little bit more optimistic at the moment because we have um, a change in approach from the executive leadership of our local authority who are making good strides, whether it be enough in time, but um, that we're seeing some very positive moves about how we can help people get to the right place more quickly. Right. And this is about providing right. good care for people. Well, it's not just about bed. Okay, so let's focus on that delayed yep. transfer of care because when we spoke to you back in February, yep. that was clearly a huge issue. The government says it's provided two billion in additional funding for social fair care. Is that... Uh, are you confident that will make a bit of a difference, at least on that one blockage at the, well, at the end of the system? What we've seen, so we work with quite a lot of local authorities. The two main ones are Birmingham, obviously, yeah. and Solihull. And Solihull has um, gone in from over 400 delayed um, d days lost to delayed transfers of care in June to less than fewer than 11 in September. So with a concentrated effort you can do that and that's been magnificent. And Birmingham, um, it, it started a bit later because its new leadership team came in later, are doing similar things. So I am quite confident we are going to see some movement happening there. Right. But I would also like to look at what the NHS does. Because they have to that there's a care issue in the NHS as well as local Yeah, for something right? called continuing health care, where people have got health care needs that are assessed as belonging to the NHS. And one of the things that's been particularly um, upsetting, I think, is that when people want to go home to die, they're assessed as needing continuing health care. They're put on what's called a fast-track system. But in the past six months alone, 75 people have died in one of the hospitals I'm responsible for, waiting for that continuing health care. So they've died in hospital? Yes, rather than at home. And that's a fast-track system that's, that's taking... Months, basically. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, take, some, sometimes it does that's, take months. That's hopeless. Uh, there's a story in The Guardian today suggesting that the government is going to pay people £1,000 a month to take someone in to take them out of hospital if they need recuperation. Is that, does that work, actually, that you can put them in, you know, my spare bedroom? Um, I'm not sure. It's, it's certainly an idea that's been touted around before and people have got concerns about how you vet the individuals, how you check up on progress and how um, you would monitor that. But I think at the moment things are worth a try. Right. Do you think we ever get back to the A&E target of 95%? Basically, we, we, we're way off the target. 95% seen within four hours is a sign of a system that is working and we're way off it at the moment. Well, I think you, one of the things is quite difficult is how you measure this. So if you bring in a system to improve care for patients. So for example, you saw patients coming in through the emergency department who could have maybe more appropriately gone to somewhere else. So a man who came in and said, I've had cancer. Well, we've set up an acute oncology unit so people bypass the emergency department, go straight to that ward. You can't count those in the numbers going through the emergency department. And if you start trying to count in all the other pathways that you've put in to try and speed things up for patients, you do get closer to it, but we don't consistently measure it. If you provide care outside of hospital, so people don't come through the emergency department again. Right. You, 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 so we're not always measuring the same thing. Okay. Um, we've talked about people coming out of the system into you know, care or whatever they need. The numbers coming in is another part of the yeah. problem that your, your staff there were talking about. There are more people coming in. Now, is that a problem with GPs or is that population growth or what is that? It, I don't think it's so much a problem with GPs because a lot of the patients you saw coming in there really needed to be in. That was not something that the GPs could necessarily deal with. It's a symptom of we're living longer, we're living longer with more diseases, and we've seen a 16% rise in the emergency departments at the QE right. in the past two years. And that is a massive increase by anybody's imagination. And I, I said at the start, the walls aren't elastic and we haven't got all the staff in the world, so we'll do what we can to do that, but we have to have the whole hospital, the whole system working together. Mm. What would it take to go back to the good old days? You know, Chris showed us that picture where, OK, there was a bit of a dip in winter and the waiting times went up, but it was basically 95%. What would it take? Because so far you haven't present, presented a hugely grim picture of this winter. I mean, actually probably rather better than some yeah. other uh, doctors I've, I've heard talking about the prospect. But what would it take to actually go back to a kind of well-functioning system that met all the targets? We haven't got enough capacity, we haven't got enough beds, we haven't got enough staff, and I think that's what we need to focus on. Alternatives to in-hospital care are great, and we need to do that, but at the moment, a lot of those patients do need to be in hospital. We need to train a lot more staff as well. And one of the other problems, why there are problems with delayed transfers of care, is it's quite difficult to staff the nursing homes 
and certainly for us to be able to afford the nursing homes and to get people to provide care in people's homes. We don't value caring as an occupation very much in this country. It, often some of these carers are paid minimum wage or just above it and actually it's one of the most important jobs you can do. We need to value it far more highly. Indeed so. Dame Julie Moore, thank you very much and thanks for letting us in to fill in the hospital. Thanks. Thank you.